All right, let's start. So, what this talk is going to be about? It's going to be about some basics, some theory that I wish I had known when I started. It's definitely not a step-by-step -step instruction on how to stop it, SDR, DSP, or whatever, uh, but it should give you enough info to search for more data. There's a lot of presentations or instructions on how to start with specific examples with hardware and software. So it's, it's more of an introduction to the things that aren't obvious. And I decided to show the radio because it has some Python in it. Yeah, uh, some legal first. Uh, the fact that you can receive, uh, receive some radio stuff doesn't mean that it's always legal. In Poland it's officially legal always, however I know people that got sentenced for listening to the radio, so it's tricky. Anyway, uh, be responsible and figure out what's legal, what's not. In general it's legal to listen to the stuff that you transmit or the devices that you own transmit. So, the best way to transmit is to get an amateur license, I recommend it. There are two URLs below that you can check out if you're from Poland, I recommend pzk.info.pl And if you're not, then you can try IRO, it should have a list of uh, associations or organizations that help you. Yeah. So, it's kind of tricky. How I expected it to. Okay, so, no radio. Uh, first, uh, what can we do with no radio? Then, the theory that I mentioned. And then, I'll show you a simple pipeline and for SDR radio listening. So, who am I? Uh, I'm Leszek Kowalski. Um, interested in radio, electronics, robots, all kinds of stuff. Uh, during the day, I work uh, mostly with monitoring distributed systems, but it's boring. Uh, I like automation a lot, and that's it about me. Let's talk about signals. What kinds of signals are there? You can hear me, so there's audio signals, there's video signals, there's ultrasound signals, like Christian said. You can listen to how capacitors vibrate in your computer. There's also radio signals. So, uh, over the radio, we talk, we send the video signals, we do some digital voice communication, we send a lot of telemetry data, and that's what interests me most. Mostly due to Internet of Things, so all the light bulbs, light bulbs toasters, fridges, and Webcams are actually sending a lot of data that you're not aware of and it's kind of interesting to see what they are talking about. Also, you can build your own radar. Uh, some people did it with pretty cheap hardware, so I recommend just googling about DSP and what people have done. For example, uh, there's a guy, uh, UHF Satka, who, well, Looks, looks at what satellites sent, and this is a tweet from him. Uh, basically, he uh, captured some signals sent by weather satellites, patched them together, and did all that on a banana pie board. So, you don't need uh, that much CPU power to do this. Also, airplanes. Airplanes talk to each other, and they actually talk to everyone. They send their position, altitude, stuff like that. So, if you ever visited like a flight tracking web page with a map, that's how they work. They capture the data from the airways and then plot it on the map. You can do, the, do it too, quite easy. So, theory. Uh, we're going to talk about sinusoids uh, because that's, that's the simplest of signals. One disclaimer, I'm going to lie to you a lot to simplify some stuff. Okay. And it's not because I don't like it, but I don't have the time. Also, you would get very, very bored if I went into details. So, there's a lot of simplifications here. 
be aware of that. If you find something more complicated but more accurate, then that thing is probably right. And that means that I lied to you at that moment. So, a sinusoid. A sinusoid is uh, something like a sine wave. However, it can be translated in phase, so you have the phi there that will move the sinusoid left and right. You have an amplitude, it's the A at the beginning. If you multiply by 2, it will be 2 times higher. If you multiply by 1 third, it will be 3 times lower. And you have an angular frequency. The angular frequency uh, is basically frequency times 360 degrees. So, be aware of that. Also, uh, the function is, uh, it has one argument, which is time, and that's the t. Uh, the equation number two is also describing a sinusoid, but it's in the complex domain. How many people have used complex numbers over here? Alright. For other people, uh, for other people, a complex number is basically a tuple with two numeric uh, parts. So, for, at least for for our presentation, that's enough. And a complex number is also the first element of the tuple plus j times the second element of the tuple. It can simplify some calculations. Also, I use j because I'm not a mathematician, and I'll, I use i for current. Mathematicians use i instead of j. Be aware of that when you're browsing the internet and you get i's, j's mixed up. Okay, so this is how a sinusoid is made. You have a point, then you give it some angular uh, momentum, basically. So an angular frequency means that the point rotates, and hopefully, yeah, it loaded. So the point rotates, and this is a positive frequency which generates a wave like this one. Now, if we have a negative angular frequency, the point turns the other way, and we get the same wave. So, why? Mostly because uh, the complex numbers are the complex numbers uh, have a real part and an imaginary part, so we can only receive and transmit the real component, basically. The imaginary part is, well, imaginary, it doesn't exist. So, this is uh, a frequency domain display, so before we had the sinus going right, uh, it was in the time domain. This is the same sine wave in the frequency domain because it had only one frequency, so we have a blip on this graph. And this is a positive frequency of, I think, 100 hertz. However, in reality, the graph looks like this because we aren't able to tell if it's a positive sine wave or a negative sine wave. I mean, uh, if the sine wave has a positive frequency or a negative frequency. But remember that the negative frequencies don't exist, so it doesn't really matter. But it's helpful in calculations. So, did you get any useful info from the previous section? No. Okay. The positive and negative frequencies are useful only when we move, move above the absolute zero. So if you want to process a signal that's, for example, around 100 megahertz, you don't actually have to process it at 100 megahertz. You can shift it down to zero, and it's much easier to process the actual signal when it's close to zero. The calculations are so clever, you don't need that much CPU power, this kind of stuff. That's why it makes sense to use the negative frequencies, because they aren't actually below the absolute zero frequency. It's just that it's below the 100 megahertz point which we moved to zero. Okay, so, sampling. Uh, who knows the Nyquist Shannon theorem on sampling? Yeah, half the room. Okay, so, to, <laughs> to get an analog signal, an accurate representation of an analog signal in a digital domain, you have to have a sampling frequency of at least twice the highest 
frequency in the analog signal. So for, for example, this, this is about three times more than the frequency of the sine wave. So basically this is all the info you need to reproduce that sine wave. So before that, for example, you have a sound, your sound card uh, changes that into samples, and your computer sees this. And that's great, because you can get the sign back. How do you do it? Well, basically you connect the dots, and as you can see, the sine wave is, well, not exactly. Right? Something's wrong. So, this is the original. And the problem is that you can't just connect the dots to interpolate between samples. Uh, to get the sine wave back, we use, we use something called the sync function. Uh, this function has a nice property that at zero it has the value of one, and uh, at all integer values, both positive and negative, it has a value of zero. So it doesn't affect the neighboring samples. So, if we now use it to reproduce the sine wave from the samples, first we put the sync function on the first sample, which is to the left, and multiply it by the sample, so it's a bit smaller than one. And that's okay. Then we do the same with the second sample. Then we add them together, and it's getting more wobbly. Then we add the third sample, I mean, putting the same function on the third sample, adding it to the signal that we already have, then the same on the fourth sample, and so on. And as you can see, it's almost done. The only thing missing is near the edges, and that's because basically the sync function uh, has to be, uh, I mean, the sampling goes into infinity on both ends, which we don't have on this graph, so all the samples to the left are zero, all the samples to the right are zero, so it's not actually a uh, true sine wave. However, if we add samples to the left and to the right, then basically we have a reproduced signal. signal. Also, one thing to remember is that the sync, one, the sync function goes into infinity. It's never fully flat at the ends. So you might lose some data. What's next? Ah, folding. So what happens when you get a signal that's more than half the sampling frequency. So in this example, we have an original signal at 100 hertz, and the sampling frequency is 1 kilohertz, so 1,000 hertz. So if we reproduce it, we get the same signal. However, if we have a signal that's above, above uh, 500 hertz, so above the half the sampling frequency, and we try to reproduce it, we get a signal over here. Why over here? Mostly because of aliasing, and I won't really explain how it works in detail, but the easiest way to remember it is that it falls at half, half the sampling frequency. So if you take it as a piece of paper, fold it, fold it, fold it, you will get all the aliases of the original signal, and we usually pick the part when it come, goes from zero to the first uh, half of the sampling frequency, but you can pick any other uh, band if you really want to. It's useful sometimes. So please remember that if you ignore Nyquist, you will get a lot more than you expected. Uh, however, if you do the sampling in the complex domain, you get twice as much data, so basically the bandwidth that you get back is twice as much. So the folding happens only at the sampling frequency. This is not a violation of the Nyquist theorem, because we get two samples per uh, sampling point. So still the sampling the average sampling frequency is two times that. Okay, so, modulation. We have a signal. Now let's put some information on it. Uh, as you can remember, this is the sinusoid, so uh, we have several parameters that we can mess with. First one is amplitude, 
Second one is the angular frequency and also the phase. And you already know this because amplitude modulation. You know what AM radio is, right? Yes. Yeah. So you have a carrier wave, which is in, for example, kilohertz. You have a signal, which is, for example, speech, which is up to, let's say, 4 kilohertz. And you just modulate it in amplitude. So you change the amplitude of the carrier wave to reflect the, the information you want to transmit. And that's pretty simple, you just multiply it. In case of frequency modulation, you also change the other parameter, which is the frequency. And you can see here uh, that the output signal in the bottom has the same amplitude throughout the transmission, and that's really nice, because, just because it doesn't matter how far from the transmitter you are. You will always get a signal that's easily recoverable. Okay, one more thing, when you're transmitting digital data, it's usually call, called keying. So, uh, here it's binary frequency shift keying. So the signal is, it has two values, I mean two symbols that it transmits. And the output signal is not really nice because I did the graph a bit wrong. But usually it's continuous because of physics. And uh, you can see that, for example, the zero symbol is a lower frequency, the half symbol is higher frequency, and we can also mess with phase. However, messing with phase when dealing with a continuous input signal is basically the same as frequency modulation, but a bit different. However, you can demodulate it with a normal FM receiver, but in case of digital signals that change rapidly, you can see that the signal has the same frequency, the output signal has the same frequency, has the same amplitude, however it switches by 180 degrees when the symbol changes. So, these are the three kinds of modulation. What's next? Ah, the interesting part. So, let's say you want to receive some radio signals. You obviously need some hardware, some software, and how to put it together. So, in case of hardware, you can start pretty cheaply. Uh, either you can buy a $20 receiver, it's really cheap, and it works, kinda. You have to know its limitations. It's, it's not professional, it will not be very accurate, but it works. You can buy uh, some more expensive equipment, uh, depending on your budget. And the most important part in the whole setup is basically the antenna. In case of the $20 RTL SDR, the antenna is really cheap. I recommend making your own. And don't worry, you will make a better one, because this one is really horrible. And I mean it. Just take a piece of wire and it will be a better antenna. Okay, software. There's there's many to choose from. We have the radio, which I'm going to show you. We have GQRX, which is which has a nicer interface if you want to just listen to normal analog radio. We have Bobline, which is nice if you want to analyze signals. In Spectrum, the same. Uh, RTL FM uh, also has some in interesting features, uh, but it's uh, it's quite specific, I mean it can demodulate FM, AM, you know, the basic stuff. RFCAT, RFLIP, uh, also a, a nice tool if you want to do a signal analysis or rather reversing. Uh, if you want to learn more about those tools, I know that Mike Osman has a presentation from, I think, Turcon, that's available on YouTube, and I recommend it. So, today we're going to talk only about radio. And GNU Radio is a uh, free and open source. Uh, it's basically general purpose. It's like a lab. You have blocks that act as filters, act as sources, act as sinks. So you have a lab with a lot of, let's say, devices that you connect together to get your signal path. Uh, it's written 
in C++, I mean the actual blocks that process the data are written in C and C++, but you can connect them together either in C++ if you really want to, or in Python, and I recommend Python. Uh, there's a lot of documentation. Uh, it's basically a reference manual for the API, so it's very, very long, but you can find almost everything in there. And it includes uh, WX widgets or QT, your preference, as the GUI layer. So, ah, yeah, the only example with actual Python code. So, Oh. Yeah. All right. So, uh, this is just an example file. You, you don't have to read too much into it. So, we start with imports. We import a lot of uh, libraries from the radio. Uh, then we start a class which is called top blocks in this case, which is a GUI, a WX GUI uh, descendant. So, some init, you initialize the variables, you create the objects, uh, oh, sorry, you create the blocks, the devices that process your signal, add them, add them. Next thing, you, you connect them together, you set some values, and that's it, and you run it. And if you already saw my Python code before, you know that I haven't drawn this one because it has very pretty indentation. The variable names are descriptive, so obviously it's not me who wrote this code. It was auto-generated, and, <laughs> and it was auto-generated by the radio companion, which looks like well, like this. So basically you get blocks, you connect them together, and it generates Python code. I wanted to show you the Python code, mostly because it's easier to automate when you look at the output py file and just add your automation into that, than trying to automate stuff over here. But this display is pretty nice if you want to start out and figure out what connects to what, and get stuff going. Okay. So, yeah. No radio companion. And now we're going to talk about what the radio shows you. So you can get the output in several different ways. The easiest one is uh, the audio output, which just outputs your sound card. However, there are some graphic outputs that need some explanation. One of them is the oscilloscope, which just shows you the wave. It's pretty self-explanatory, you have time here, you have uh, two plots here, two plots because we're graphing it in the complex domain, you can have one plot if you have one value. Uh, this is the constellation sync, uh, which displays the IQ graph, or the complex graph, or the quadrature graph. Uh, all of them mean one and the same thing. If you remember the point that was going round and round to make a sound wave, basically these are, these are the last, how many? Uh, 62 million samples? No. It, it takes a bunch of samples and just displays the last n samples on the graph. So this is very useful if you're uh, doing, doing some face modulation stuff. It shows the constellation pretty nicely. So another thing is the frequency displays. So FFT and the waterfall. Uh, FFT is just uh, frequencies at one point in time. The waterfall is the same, but it shows you how it changed in time. So the graph scrolls up. If you can see the correlation, if you have a bump, the waterfall plot just changes color in this place. And you can change the scale if you want to, I just use the defaults. Okay, so using the GUI elements, uh, you can have sliders, nodes, and whatever you want uh, to change some parameters during uh, your run. It's quite useful if you want to tune into a radio station uh, or something like that or change some parameters on the fly and not just change the value, or, uh, rebuild the pi file, run the pi file, see that you're off by two or three, and then redo the whole thing. So, variables. 
You can use uh, the GUI elements or any other uh, value uh, as a base in calculating your variables that you can reuse in other elements. And yeah, we're going to build an example pipeline here. So, a quick break, sorry. So we start our pipeline with the source. It can be a radio, like this one. It can be a file. It can be your sound card. It can be whatever. Over here I'm showing you a file source. So for example, if you captured some samples, you can output those samples through a throttle. We need to use the throttle because otherwise the radio will process all the samples as fast as it, as fast as it can. And with today's CPUs, it will be quite fast, so you might not notice that it did anything. Uh, if you have a radio source, you just use it as it comes, because usually the parameters uh, set up all the things that have to be set up for the radio to work. For example, we have the frequency, we have the DC offset mode setting, uh, basically Oh, all right, I'll explain the DC offset in a moment. Uh, you have gain settings in case your radio source has amplifiers, but in most cases the defaults work quite fine. So then, when you receive a signal, it looks something like this. Uh, in this case, it's a radio station, a standard you know, FM radio that you can receive on your phone, for example, or with a cheap radio. Uh, in this case, we're tuned in almost into the radio station. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, but we have an offset of minus 100 kilohertz. The offset is important because if you look at the waterfall at zero, we have some noise. And this is DC noise, uh, which is present in all cheap RTL SDR or other cheap SDR devices, in the more expensive ones it's compensated, so it's not that much of a problem. However, I always recommend to tune in to the radio station just a bit off, so that you can then correct the frequency yourself and don't, you don't have to fight with the DC noise. So the next step is translating it to the center. So like I said before, it's easier to process signals if they are at zero frequency, which might be strange, but when, it, when it's at zero frequency, if you remember the rotating dot, it just means that the dot is standing still. So if you have an, an amplitude modulation, the dot will move up and down as the signal goes, it won't rotate. If you have a frequency modulation, the dot will, will rotate a bit to the right or to the left, instead of rotating continuously with the frequency. So, we shift it to zero, so our signal looks like this right now. Then we filter it. It's kind of important to get rid of the signal that we don't need. Basically, that's noise, not the signal. So, everything that we don't need, we have to Okay, this one works. We have to filter out, and we use a finite impulse response filter in this case. It, you can read up on finite impulse response and infinite impulse response filters later. Uh, basically, I prefer FIRs because while well, they're slower, uh, they have better parameters and cannot go into uh, oscillation. Uh, but you have to provide something called TAPS. It's an array. And uh, in this case, you can use an array with one element of one, and that filter does exactly nothing, because it multiplies the, all the samples by one. However, if you want, for example, a low-pass filter, you can use the built-in functions in GNU Radio. So you just enter this into, into your filter tabs field, and it will be 
calculated. So to explain the function, you have the gain, which in this case is 1, you have the sampling rate, uh, which you got from your source, in our case it was 1 MHz, you have the frequency that you want to cut off, cut off on, so uh, for example, in this case it's a low pass filter, so if we put in, I don't know, six, 16,000 Hz, it will cut off everything that's above that frequency. You have the transition uh, hertz because you cannot just cut, up, cut it off vertically due to physics, basically. Uh, it has to have a slope. And there's a humming window, and I won't go into describing filtering windows right now. So, after filtering our signal, we get something like this, uh, which is nice, but we get a lot of samples that don't carry any data because that's all zeros to the left and to the right of our signal. So why process all that samples, why waste CPU power, when you can just decimate it? So basically, this is what decimation means. We pick every fifth sample, and after that, we don't have the parts on the sides. And I pick the value of five, because if you look over here, we have 200 kilohertz of signal and one megahertz of the whole bandwidth. So if you divide one by another, get 5, and that's the actual signal that we have to demodulate. But remember that after decimation, the sampling rate changes, so if we decimate a 1 uh, megahertz sampled signal, we get 200 kilohertz signal, so if we get uh, the modulator block right now, you have to remember to correct the sampling rate, in this case called quadrature rate, which basically means that the samples coming in are complex numbers, and uh, the output is uh, a floating point, uh, a chain of floating point samples, so it's one dimensional. And after the modulation, we get a, a nice FM broadcast signal, which is complex in, a, in of itself, so it's kind of interesting. At first, if you look, you have the audio, so this is what you're hearing in your radio, then at 19 kHz you have a pilot signal, which basically helps your radio find the radio stations, even if no one is speaking at the moment or there's no music. Then you have the stereo signal, which is barely visible up there on the waterfall, but it's uh, quite visible on the FFT plot, on the peak values. Uh, it's actually a difference between the left and the right channel instead of transmitting a second channel. And then you get some digital data, including RDS and other stuff. And uh, if you're interested in the other stuff, there's actually one person that I would like to recommend uh, to follow, uh, Una Reisinger, who did a lot of analysis on RDS and other information sent uh, with the broadcast signal. So, after receiving that signal, we saw there are a lot of components, but we're interested only in uh, the audio part, so we filter everything above that out. We set, uh, set our cutoff frequency at six, uh, 16,000 hertz, and it just cuts everything off. And then we do some resampling because our uh, sound card probably cannot handle 200 kilohertz of sample a sampling frequency, so we have to get it down to something our sound card can support. In my case, it's 48,000 Hz. So to get that sampling frequency, I use the rational resampler, uh, which takes two values, and that's how I got those two values. I started with 200 kHz sampling of the input, had to multiply by 6, divide by 25, and I got the output sampling frequency, and this is the actual audio signal. Unfortunately, I don't have a live demo today, because I tried finding some radio stations here, and I couldn't receive anything. Sorry. Yeah, so, interesting people, interesting projects. Uh, there's Alexander Set, who's the author of GQRX. He has a lot of interesting SDR stuff, uh, on his Twitter, or uh, he also uh, publishes some stuff on his blog, as far as I remember. 
Uh, there's Una Reisenden, who does a lot of interesting signal stuff, mostly around the uh, FM broadcast stations. But she also did the graphic showing the modern signal. I don't know if you remember the graph showing what each of the tones in the modern negotiation mean. That's also her. Uh, Michael Osman, who did a lot of research mostly in the security area, so he prepared He's actually the author of uh, Hacker F1. He also did some training presentations that I recommend. Uh, these are the actual step-by-step -step tutorials of how to get started and uh, which connection goes where and how to get from a device in your hand to a reverse protocol. And uh, Travis Goodspeed, who does a lot of wonderful work, including the IME hacks, uh, also working right now on some digital mobile radios. Uh, UHF Satcom, who publishes his results uh, when it comes to receiving satellite signals. There's, there's also uh, an online DSP guide. It's a whole book about signal processing, which is written in a very simple language, so I understood it. So I think you will do it without any problems if I understood it, anyone can. Uh, and also there's uh, some papers from Stanford about uh, discrete Fourier transforms if you're interested in this kind of signal processing. So, huh, I've got some time left. Any questions? Who was listening? <laughs> Thanks. Okay, how can you make your own antenna? Let me Google that for you. <laughs> no, sorry, I can't. So the question was, how can I make my own antenna? So first you need a wire with a proper connector. I recommend taking, taking the antenna you got and cutting off the wire, because it has the right connector already. And then you can uh, just separate the center wire and the screen, so you have the hot wire, which has the actual signal, I mean, it will receive the actual signal, and the screen, which is the ground reference, and then you have to cut two wires to appropriate length, basically to quarter wave length. So, waves, and their length, and frequency. Uh, okay, so when you have a wave, a radio wave that travels through air, or vacuum, or whatever, it has a length, right? Because it's not instant. It has to travel. So, to get the wavelength of a radio wave in air, you basically take... Uh, I don't remember the formula. I think, uh, was it 300 divided by the frequency that gave you the wavelength? If you divided it... Ah, let me do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 things like that. But I don't remember the actual formula, so calculating wave length. Actually, I shouldn't do that uh, when they are recording, mostly because I have an amateur radio license and I'm supposed to know this. But. <laughs> Yeah, but you can find the formula, unfortunately, I don't have any connectivity here, so sorry, I cannot Google that for you. But, but so should I have a wire that goes from the So if uh, my, my antenna length is uh, depending on uh, frequency, uh, so for uh, all frequencies I need uh, infinite number of antennas, right? That's true. However, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so the basic antenna is a dipole. You can Google dipole, it's the simplest you can make, basically two wires, quarter wavelength. However, you have, for example, disco antennas, which have wires at different angles, and thanks to that, they can receive uh, their sorry, their base frequency and uh, about ten times their base, up to 10 times the, their base frequency. But if you have an RTL-SDR that fell down here somewhere, 
it, it has a very cheap receiver, and that's a good thing because it's cheap. But it's also a bad thing because it can be easily uh, overdriven by signals that you don't want. So I recommend making a very narrow band antenna because it will also, also function as a filter. I mean, the antenna will also function as an antenna when you have, for example, if you want to listen to something at 100 megahertz, if you make an antenna for 100 megahertz, then it will also work for 110 and 120. At 130, you will get very low signals, but it will still kind of work. And also the other way, if you want to get a signal of 90 MHz working on this antenna, it will also work, but it will be a bit lower in power when you look at the results. So it's not, it doesn't have to be perfectly tuned, but it has to be more or less in the same band. What's the frequency divided the speed of the medium? Okay, so the formula to calculate the length is frequency in megahertz divided by 300, and that gives you the wavelength in meters. So I have one question about those legal, legal matters. Uh, so, so you say in Poland I can receive without any kind of uh, license, right? Yes, you uh, don't need a license to receive. You have, however, many different laws. I'm not a lawyer, so do not rely on my recommendations, but you have a, a law which says basically that you can receive energy. However, there's also something called the secret of communication or the telco secret. So if someone is communicating with someone else and you by accident listen to that, you cannot reveal that information and go to Twitter, oh my god, oh my god, I received this. So, so what about all those people who are posting those planes uh, traveling or, or around? Is it, is it okay? Or? Yeah, because it's public info. It's specified in open standards. It's transmitted to everyone, right? You can also spot a plane with, a, with binoculars, so it's not secret, really, right? Uh, but if I would like to open my own radio station, then I need some other kind of permission, right? If I like to recreate signal, right? Yeah, if you want to transmit signals, you need that permission. Uh, in case you have, for example, a remote for your garage door, it functions in bands called ISM bands, which are open, but do, uh, have some limits when it comes to power. So very low power devices in certain frequency bands are allowed without a permission, but in general, yes, you need a permission. Okay, thanks. Can you transmit stuff with new radio? Could you repeat the question? Can you transmit stuff with new radio? Yes, actually no, because it's just software, so you cannot do this with software, but new radio supports, for example, HackerF1, which I showed. Uh, there are more expensive, there are more expensive SDR uh, radios, so this is a cheap one you can only receive. But for example, HackerF1, which costs, I think, $300, can also transmit. But you have to be very careful because you need permissions, right? And also, if you start transmitting over some other signal, then the company that has the actual permission to transmit there will report you and try to track you down. So you can use HackerF1, you can use PlayDRF, which is twice the price of HackerF1, like around $600. If you really have a lot of money, uh, there's a USRP, which is a perfect box if you want to experiment with radio waves, but it costs around five thousand dollars. Can you trust me with low powers? Something very yes, you could, and you know it's not allowed, right? So if... yeah, it depends. <laughs> I mean. Uh, the law, ask a lawyer, basically. Oh, okay. If you want to transmit with low powers in ISM bands, then there are clear limits. If you want to transmit with low powers somewhere else, then it depends. Basically, if no one else is inter if you don't interfere with anyone, then it's okay, but you need to like uh, cover all your walls with copper or some kind of conductor to you know, stop the radio waves from coming out of your room. Then, then you can experiment with anything. 
So this Python code you had was auto-generated. Uh, how, how difficult it is to write it looking at the documentation? Is the documentation good or...? Yeah, the documentation is good, but it's, it's hard to start. I mean, it's also a menial task. You basically add modules, which are Python classes from your point of view, and then you add connections, which, which as far as I remember are just method calls that say, hey, this module, please connect with this module. So, I know, if you'd like to, it's pretty easy to learn. If you are not allowed to transmit signals, how can you actually work with the Wi-Fi, right? With 2.6 gigahertz frequencies or Bluetooth or stuff, So, right? So you're basically transmitting something. Can yes. you do this with... If you look at your Wi-Fi card, it probably has some kind of certificate of uh, compliance. And it, it, it means that it was tested, or actually the model you have, so a device similar to yours has been tested and it transmits up to a certain power and also 2.4 gigahertz is an ISM band so it's the relaxed part of the band right and anyone can transmit in the ISM bands up to a certain power there are some other limitations so read up on it it's legally so I don't want to give any you know recommendation that could put someone in jail yeah, but basically you can modulate your signal over this and right, 2.6 and... Yeah, but it's like very low power. I mean, Wi-Fi in Poland... Yeah, if, if you'd want to just experiment with the radio, right, and transmitting, receiving stuff and... Yeah, that's why I recommend... Even Wikipedia has a list of ISM bands. So you have 2.4 gigahertz, you have the 400 megahertz band, you have 5.8 gigahertz. So, yeah. And which of those devices you showed actually can transmit at 2.6 hertz? Uh, at 2.4 gigahertz, right? The Wi-Fi band. Yeah. Okay, so I think LayerF for sure, I think HackerF1 also, but it has a very weak signal up there, because HackerF1, as far as I remember, goes up to 3 gigahertz. Yeah, okay, thanks. What's the weirdest thing that you have heard over the radio? I cannot tell you that, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. Okay, so... We'll have to pick. Yeah. Who has a question? Okay, so we have a head start when it comes to supper, because I guess it's supper time right now, or rather in five minutes, so you can get in line first, before the other room. Sorry? Ah, lightning talks. Okay, so, sorry, sorry. I messed up. Uh, the agenda says lightning talks. So, yeah, thank you.